name is Mavis Jackson and I am the Director of College Readiness for Baltimore City Schools and I um, have the pleasure to host this um, How to Navigate the College Admissions Process and COVID session. Um, it's something that was very important. We got a, we've been getting a lot of questions from students and families around um, the admissions process and COVID and um, I figured the best way to help answer those questions would be directly from our folks in admissions, our great partners, um, and our wonderful institutions here in Maryland. Um, and I figured they could answer the questions best. And I, um, you know, so I just wanted to make sure I pulled folks together and opened it up to the community. So without further ado, I will just kind of get into our programming for today. So um, just to kind of get a, give us a sense of who's in the room, um, the question is, um, what, you know, who's in the room? What grade level are you all in? So um, you can just on your phone if you're able to, if you're not able to, I definitely understand, but you could just go to slido.com and you can, um, the code is M011. Um, and that just gives us a good idea of like what grade level folks are in. So if we have our, you know, maybe some middle schoolers trying to get some answers, questions answered, some folks in ninth, 10th, 11th, or 12th grade, or some other grade. So again, you can just go to slido.com, and the code is M011, and then you can just um, select which grade level best aligns with where you are. And I'll give folks a few minutes. Okay, so we have a 10th grader here. Let's see, what else do we have? It's early, always early to get that that early head start. Oh, and I am, there we go. So we have a 10th grader in the room. What else? So again, you're going to slido.com and the code is M011. And then that just kind of gets you to our um, presentation. Well, to, the, um, to this part of the presentation. And then we can just kind of see who's in the room. So we have, some 10th graders, some 12th graders, anybody else? Okay, some, some other, so probably adults supporting some students. Um, all right, so our eighth graders, ninth graders, and 11th graders, they're just not here today. Oh, okay, here come the 11th graders. Okay, good, that's, that's good to see. So again, the conversation today, you know, it's, it's really about during these COVID times, what, what does admissions look like? And I think that's an important conversation to have because you know there are a lot of things that are a little different. And so our goal is really to have a conversation around from, from the perspective of different types of institutions, what that um, admissions process looks like. So great, so mostly 12th graders, a few 11th graders, some 10th graders, some other. All right, wonderful. So I just want to kind of go over the agenda a little bit. So we're um, doing the welcome now. Um, I'm going to do some panelist intros and allow them to um, talk about their institutions. And then we'll have a good chunk of time for Q&A because I know folks have a lot of questions. And I will show you exactly how the Q&A process will work. So again, it's a panel style discussion. So each um, college or university partner will introduce themselves in their institution and just give a, a seven minute description about their institution. So they'll talk about all types of things. Um, there's a, a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you'll be able to post questions and then uh, we can see them and then we will uh, respond to those questions live. So whatever questions you have, you'll be able to type in the Q&A box and then um, and I will, um, when we get to the Q&A portion, I will make sure that I read all the questions and so that way you can get your answer. Um, and again, the session will, is being recorded. So the other benefit of that is it is going to live on our um, Baltimore City Schools YouTube channel. And um, we have a college and career readiness, um, uh, readiness channel on that Baltimore City YouTube. And so the recording lives there. So if you, you know, had some additional questions or something else you wanted to go back to, um, you can always refer back to the video if you like, or if you have someone that you feel like you wish was on the call today and wasn't, you can refer them to that video um, and then they can watch and see what we talked about. All righty. So 
I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, we have a wonderful bunch of folks joining us today. So we have um, Ms. Anne Shea Tall. She's, she is uh, from Pocomoke City, Maryland. She's a Pocomoke City, uh, Maryland native, excuse me. She works as an admissions counselor and recruiter for the University of Maryland Eastern Shore Office of Admissions and Recruitment located in Princess Anne, Maryland. She graduated from UMES and Princess Anne with a bachelor's degree of in science and criminal justice. Um, and she will graduate with a master's of education in counselor education um, this fall, November 2020. Oh, that's coming up very quickly. Um, Ms. Stephanie Stoller from McDaniel College. She's starting her 23rd year in college admissions. Uh, she works with students from Baltimore City and Baltimore County and Southern Maryland. Her advice to students going through the college search process is to recognize that college can't be a great experience if you're not willing to put yourself out there and engage with your professors and classmates on a deeper level. We also have Dale Biddinger. Um, he's an assistant vice provost for undergraduate admissions, orientation, and school partnerships at UMBC. Um, and he's been in higher education for over 20 years. In 2007, the Chronicle of Higher Ed named him as one of the 10 influential admissions deans and directors in the country. He is currently on the Common App Board of Directors where he co-chairs a task force on evolving the Common App. In addition, he serves on the board of the Potomac Chesapeake Association of College Admissions Counseling, also known as PACAC, where he chairs the Admissions Practices Committee as well as um, he's also an assembly delegate for the National Association for College Admissions Counseling, NACAC. He previously served as the College Board's Admissions and Enrollment Services Advisory Group, excuse me, um, Advisory Group and the College Board's Regional Council. He is also currently the Vice President of the Board of Trustees at Roland Park Country School and All Girls Independent School in Baltimore. In 2015, he completed the Leadership Baltimore County Program in the community, he has served as girls youth basketball coach for the last seven years. He holds a Master's of Arts in Counseling from West Virginia University and a Master of Public Policy in Public Policy from UMBC. We also have Pat Salmon, the Associate Director of Admissions from Johns Hopkins, and Courtney Milton. She's the Assistant Director of Admissions and Diversity Initiatives at University of Maryland College Park and she's the territory manager for Baltimore City. So that is our panel for today. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, what we'll do is each uh, institution will be able to share and they'll be going in the order in which they appear on this, um, on this slide deck. And um, at the end of that presentation, we'll, be, um, we'll just open it up to Q&A, okay? So we will start with UMES. I turn it over to you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you guys for having UMES this evening. And um, Ms. Jackson, do you have the slides there? Yes. To share, please. So once again, thank you guys for having UMES this evening. We are definitely happy to be here. And just to give a little back in, um, intro about myself again, I did add, I do cover all of Baltimore City's um, schools as well as now I've just taken over Baltimore County, all of D.C. and all of the Midwest states. Okay. So, but like you said, I am a 2005 graduate. My background is in criminal justice. And then I came into higher ed about six years ago and I absolutely love it. Um, but now, who are we? UMES, as you guys may already know, there are four historically black universities in the state of Maryland. We are four. Um, we are, there are number four. So what makes us a little bit different from the other three, we're the only 1890 land grant um, institution in the state of Maryland. So pretty much students who are interested in studying the world of agriculture, food science, pre-rep professionals, we have a partnership with the USDA that have national scholarships as well. We have scholarships on our campus that deal with the 1890 grant. Um, so we're a doctoral research institution. We're top performance in social mobilities. We have over 25 independent accredited programs. Over, this says 26, it should be 44, but 44 conference titles and seven national championships. As you can see, what I absolutely love about HBCUs, we have something called Coronation and Royal Court. This is our 2019 and 2020 Mr. and Mrs. UMES. Next month, we will be crowning our new Mrs. and Mrs. UMES. So for UMES, when it comes down to academics, we have 37 undergrad majors and we have five schools. We have the School of Education, Social Science and the Arts, um, Business and Technology, Pharmacy, Health Professions, Ag and Natural Science, 
two accelerated programs we actually have here on our campus is our Early Assurance Pharmacy Program. It's a five-year program. So students who are interested in becoming a pharmacist, you can actually apply through our biochem for two years and then apply for UMES's doctoral program five years. You'll have your PharmD. Then we're number two in the state when it comes to physical therapy for the doctoral level. So exercise science would be the undergrad clinical track and then do that in four years. You don't need a master's degree. You can actually apply for our doctoral program in physical therapy. So those are two top accelerated tracks that we have here. Something new, a new building that's gonna open in fall 22 is our $90 million pharmacy and health professions building. Another major that's popular here on our campus, we're the only school in the state of Maryland that has a major where you can graduate with an aviation management degree, which are professional pilot license. So if you like to fly planes, definitely look at coming to UMES, you can graduate with your professional pilot license. We're the only HBCU in the country that has a major in professional golf ma ma management. So if you play golf, definitely look at UMES again because you can play golf here and you can actually study and get a major in golf. And we'll talk a little bit more at the end um, for the Richard A. Henson Honors Program. Some of the student experiences our students have here on our campus is peer tutoring, peer mentoring, mental health counseling, career and professional development workshops and seminars. When it comes to our student experience, we sit on 1,100 acres of land. So we have 11 residence hall. It's um, coming from Baltimore City. I like to say you get the best of both worlds because we're not in a major city. It's really quiet. It's really in a rural area. And so the campus is a nice size campus, but it is still a family center environment here at UMES. So when it comes to, we have um, four traditional freshman halls and the rest remaining are our upperclassmen housing. Then we have over 70 organizations. If there is something we don't have here at UMES, um, like I said, I mentioned before, Mr. and Mrs. UMES, they are part of SGA and the Royal Court. You do have the opportunity of starting your own club here as well. So some of the other student experiences, um, we do have study abroad. So if you choose that you have, you have a strong interest of studying abroad, you could definitely get with the English and Modern Language Department. They can work out those opportunities for you. We have a swimming pool here. We have a bowling alley, or about, excuse me, a bowling alley on our campus because we do have a women's bowling team, but that is actually for our students' use as well. Game rooms, arcades, movie theaters, massage chairs, and we have actually two gyms on our campus and both have exercise facilities. So then when it comes to athletics, our conference we participate under is the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. We are Division I. As you guys may know, or if you don't know, for the next two years, the NCAA will be awaiting the SAT and the, a um, the SAT and the ACT. So if you're definitely a student who plays any of the sports that we offer here at UMES, you want to definitely make sure that you register, especially for my seniors, through the Eligibility Center, and then contact and send any film that you may have to any of the coaches of any of the athletic teams we have here. So when it comes to tuition and fees at UMES, we're fairly affordable. Uh, we offer seven to $10 million in student aid between work study, um, financial aid, department scholarship, and Dr. Anderson last year created the presidential scholarships. So you may qualify so under the um, financial aid that way, as well as merit-based too. So you're looking at roughly, if you're coming because you guys are in-state, a total of 18,643. And so you're looking close to $9,000. That's gonna include your tuition, your fees, your room, and your board. Now, freshmen, it is not mandatory for you guys to reside on campus, but of course, coming from Baltimore City, you would want to, who's gonna drive two hours to go back home every single day after having five to six classes. Um, so it's mandatory if you do reside on campus to choose between our 14 meal plan or our 19 meal plan. They are not rollover meal plans. So if you choose not to eat that day, then you just lose out on that meal, okay? So then when it comes to, let me back up. So then when it comes to the application process, because it is COVID, we're actually waiving the SAT and the um, ACT for this academic school year. So of course, we're reading from a holistic standpoint. Uh, we're gonna be looking at your GPAs, course regular trends and performance, extracurricular activities, special talents, essays, and letters of recommendation. We actually use three application platforms here. We use the Common Application, we use the Common Black College Application, and our UMES Standard Application. Now, if you are a senior today, from, beginning, it started on October 1 to the 31st of October, you can actually apply today for free. And so moving on. 
if you decide to take a gap year and you're still trying to figure out exactly what you would like to do, they can always apply later. But if you're taking community college classes, you just need a 2.0 to transfer in and at least 29 credits. Now, if you're under those 29 credits, we will go back and request um, because it's 20, we're waiting the SAT and ACT, we will request your high school transfer. We do have articulations with Baltimore Community College as well as CCDC. So if you're a senior and you're taking classes there as well, you wanna make sure you request that official transcript in the office of the register. They evaluate um, those um, credits coming in. So ways to keep up in the know with UMES and to join our Hulk family you can always follow us on social media. We're, um, we're um, adding different things every single day there because we're working virtually mostly. And you can follow us on Twitter at UMES underscore missions, UMES admissions and recruitment on Facebook, as well as UMES underscore missions on Instagram. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Um, um, I will turn it over. Oops. I guess I need to. Um, Next, we'll have McDaniel. Um, and as Stephanie prepares, for those of you that are just joining, if you have a question, um, and I see someone raising their hand, but if you have a question, actually type it in the Q&A box. It's a box that says Q&A. You can type your question there, and we will pull all of your questions from there. So again, if you have, your, um, have a question, just throw it in the Q&A box, and we will grab it from there. Mm. Hi everybody, I'm Stephanie Stoller from McDaniel College Admissions. Uh, we are located up in Westminster, Maryland. So to give you your Maryland geography a refresher, we're up in Carroll County. So we're about 30 miles Northwest of Baltimore. Um, and so depending on where you are in the city, it's a 40 minute drive, it's an hour drive. It just depends kind of on um, where you're situated around the city itself. You can go to the next Mavis. So some quick facts about McDaniel. Um, we are about 1,800 undergraduate students, so we are a small college, uh, meaning average class size is about 17 to 20 people, and that's starting in your freshman year, going through your senior year at McDaniel. 85% um, of our students do reside on campus. You're actually required to live on campus through your junior year, and we guarantee housing all four years because for us, especially as a smaller institution, we want to make sure that we have a lot of social programming for our students all four years. Um, and having students live on campus is a critical way to kind of go about doing that. Um, we are a private college, which means our students are not exclusively from the state of Maryland. Uh, we have about 32 different states represented on campus, as well as about 25 or so different countries. And majority of our out-of-state demographic is going to be between like Connecticut and North Carolina. Um, I think East, it's a very strong East Coast representation, but we have handfuls from Florida, from Texas, from California, you know, places like that. But more and more, you're going to see kind of a, a mid-Atlantic and just further on kind of representation on our campus. Um, we have about 35 majors, and within those 35 majors, there's about 60 different programs of specialization or minors. Uh, so we're what's called a liberal arts and sciences college, which means you don't need, you're, when you're applying to us, you're not applying to a school of, you're simply applying to admission to the college. And and once you're there, you have the selection and opportunity to participate in any of the majors that we have here at McDaniel. But what we really pride ourselves on is the fact that, you know, we're giving you an opportunity to really explore different disciplines. As part of a liberal arts and sciences course, um, you are going to take uh, curriculum in a lot of different areas. So if you come in undecided, if you come in with a really strong idea of what you want to do, or you're somewhere in the middle, you have a few different ideas, you're just not sure how it all kind of comes together. We have a, and have the capability kind of to get you connected to the different departments we have on campus, but also to prepare you for life after college. So, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I mentioned that the small size of our campus, um, we are, uh, as a private college, I think there's a lot of assumption that it's a very, carbon copy kind of place. Everyone looks alike, comes from the same background, has the same, um, you know, experience and participates in the same things at our college. That is really, really further, uh, far from the truth. Um, we try to make ourselves and we actively work to make our campus more representative of kind of the world you're going to go out and be a professional within. So as a result, our campus composition, um, I mentioned, you know, having some out-of-state students, but being smaller, 90% uh, of our students are financial aid recipients. And of that, about 35% of our students are Pell Grant eligible students. Uh, we're 40% first-generation college students. Uh, uh, we are 
pretty even gender identity wise. Uh, it's just always kind of worked out that way. I know some small schools are getting a lot more top heavy on the female versus the male side, but we've maintained pretty even. Um, we're at about 37% um, self-identified uh, students of color on our campus. Uh, we have a lot of different organizations to kind of continue to support all of our students that are part of our campus, but we are not religiously affiliated. So we have, a, you know, a, a, again, a broad spectrum of students with different religious backgrounds on our campus as well. You can go to the next slide, Mavis. So as I mentioned, we're a liberal arts and sciences college, which basically, um, means there, there's a few different things. The first is the McDaniel plan. All four-year colleges have a core curriculum. That's just a pretty standard thing. Uh, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to make our core curriculum really address the most sought after skill sets by employers across the country. Um, so our McDaniel plan has all these different categories that are these skills that we want you to have. But within each of these uh, different skills, there could be 30 to 50 different classes that will fulfill that particular requirement. And they're from all different disciplines across the college. So it's allowing you to very much customize your core curriculum based on your own personal interests. We're just guiding you because we know based on the feedback from professionals and employers and graduate and professional schools, you know that these are really sought after skills. So things like problem solving, analyzing data, critical thinking, strong communication and writing skills, the ability to work well in a group, collaborative dynamic as much as to work well individually. Um, recognizing your, um, you know, cross-cultural competency and recognizing, you know, your international and global perspective and how well you've grown that, that lens of yourself. So all of these are different categories within the McDaniel plan and then you're going to pick and choose based on what strikes an interest to you. This is a great way to start exploring possible majors on our campus and it's also encouraging students to go beyond what they've always known or what they're most familiar with. Um, and one of the other things that we do is called the McDaniel Commitment. The McDaniel Commitment is our promise to all of our students that during your four years here, it's going to be very intentional what you're doing uh, academically and also preparing you for your professional life after college. So the McDaniel Commitment in the winter between the fall and the spring semester of your freshman year, all first year students spend three weeks doing what's called My Design, which is led by our academic life team. And they sit down for those three weeks. This year it will be virtual. Um, but what they do is they really kind of get at what are your strengths? What are areas you need to be developing when you're in college? What are your personal passions? What are the careers and the, and the majors that you're most interested in? And really kind of getting at the why when students respond to a question. Um, you know, making sure that it in fact is a good fit. And then once we kind of get to those areas of interest, what are possible pro uh, professional experiences that you can take part in while you're at McDaniel to test the waters to see if it's in fact a good fit for you. Um, all of our students are required to do two experiential learning opportunities during your time at McDaniel. And through the McDaniel commitment, these are actually going to happen in your sophomore and junior year. And our Center for Experience and Opportunity is actually going to assist you in these experiences. Um, these could take the shape of internships, scientific research, studying abroad, uh, do a, doing a service learning project, but it's an opportunity to take the theory of class and put it into practice, to actually try out what you're thinking and envisioning as you might something that you might want to do in a professional capacity. Um, so we require this of all of our students because we know truly it is the game changer when the time comes to graduating from college. And if you're trying to get into a job right away, if you're going for a professional school or a graduate school program, your ability to show on your resume that you went beyond just, I took the classes and I got the grades. You actually have experience now behind you. And that experience makes you a much stronger candidate for whomever might be hiring you or admitting you to their program because you've tested the waters. You know that you're not just randomly applying for this job or for this graduate program. You actually know that it has been a good fit for you. Uh, so that is something that we believe really strongly in. And in your senior year, the last part of the McDaniel commitment is you will get advising and mentorship uh, from our faculty and staff all along the way. But in the senior year, the CEO office is going to sit down with all of our seniors individually and find out what their action plan is for senior year. What steps have you taken to make sure you, gr you have those post-college plans fully determined and ready to go when you graduate in May? So if it's applying to a grad school, have you done your entrance exams? Have you gotten letters of recommendation? It's all these little steps you need to take. If it's getting a job, 
Have you updated your resume? Are you doing the job fair we're having on campus? Um, you know, have you worked on your interview skill development? These are all those little steps and things that you might not naturally think of. And that's why the CEO office wants to work with all of our seniors at the beginning of senior year to make sure that you're starting those steps so that come graduation, you already have jobs locked down or you're ready to go in a grad program that might start the next month or a few months later. Uh, but again, that you're not uncertain and you have your plans figured out. Next one, Mavis. Campus life. Uh, as I said, 85% of our students live on campus. Uh, we do a lot, especially in the first year, to make sure academically and socially you're going to have a successful transition to the college. Uh, we have a dean of first year students. She actually monitors academic progress of all of our students. She's there to be a resource in case, um, you know, a student isn't showing up for class and a professor's concerned and the professor's reached out and the student isn't responding. You know, there, there's multiple uh, folks at McDaniel who are just going to be making sure that students are, you know, getting connected to the college because we know that your first year is a critical one. And when you feel connected to the community you're part of, you're gonna do your best work academically because you're gonna feel supported. You're gonna feel like people are encouraging you to strive a little further, to reach a little higher. Um, that's an important uh, important hallmark of our college. Um, and then also, you know, just making sure that you're getting involved in campus. Uh, there's a lot of school spirit at McDaniel and it's it's a really nice thing to be a part of. Uh, we have 24 varsity sports that compete at the division three level. Uh, we have more than 80 clubs and organizations and kind of like what UMAS was saying, if you have seven other people that share that interest, you can establish a club on campus. Uh, this is your experience. This is not our experience. And by clubs, they could be everything from, you know, we have a TV and a radio station. We have, um, you can participate in student government and leadership. We do a lot of service learning projects. We have fraternities and sororities. We have intramurals for people who don't have the competitive ability to be at that varsity level. It's just a nice way to stay active. Uh, we have cultural groups. We have religious groups. We have um, uh, political groups. We have political simulation groups, things like Model UN. We have anime. We have a hammock club. We have ultimate frisbee. We've got a little bit of everything. And what I love is our clubs are very reflective of the different types of students that inhabit our campus. Um, and it's really nice to see everyone being able to find that thing that really makes them feel so, um, supported and connected. Uh, you can participate in music ensembles. You can be part of theater productions. We actually put on a theater production, which is remarkable given the current situation. It was an outdoor production and everyone was socially distanced but we still got to have the theater program actually make an attempt to do a production like it was a typical fall semester. Um, homecoming is this weekend. It is a virtual homecoming and for all of us that work at the college level we're probably all having a virtual offering. It's a little weird. Um, it's not the normal thing because uh, tailgating is a very big thing at McDaniel, homecoming especially. Uh, we have spring fling in April. That's a big carnival like event on our campus but there's things kind of scattered throughout the year that are just again more of these kind of come together opportunities on campus. Next. And as far as the application process goes, uh, we too are an, a common application school, but we also have our own McDaniel application. Um, we require a high school transcript, the personal essay, letter of recommendation from a teacher is optional. And we've actually been a test optional school for the last 12 years. So we're test optional both for admission as well as for scholarship consideration. You don't need to submit anything in its place. Uh, it's just never been part of our, of our consideration process. Uh, we do look at every element that goes into your application. Um, and so please also make sure when it comes to the activities resume section, make sure you're talking about the things you do. Even if they're not traditional things, like they're not athletics or theater or something like that in your school. If you work a part-time job, if you take care of younger siblings, if you take care of maybe a, a family member who's got some medical challenges, maybe you work within your religious organization or you do things through community service, things that just aren't affiliated with your high school, please know that those have value and you should include that information in your application because what we as a college admissions folks are looking for is what do you do in your free time? So however you can best convey that, but please don't think, oh, if I don't do something through my school, it's not relevant it doesn't need it doesn't have a box on the application there's always some way that you can fit it in and it's important because it reflects what's important to you um, oh the slide kind of is cut off a little here uh, but down there on the deadlines and timelines let me just talk about that we do early action which is non-binding uh, we have a 
November 15th and a December 15th, if you happen to be a senior listening in, those are our early action deadlines. And then we have a regular decision deadline in the spring. Uh, we do have early decision, but I really don't recommend it to a student unless they tell me, I wanna come to McDaniel, absolutely, financially, academically, socially, I know it's the perfect fit. We can talk early decision, but early decision is a binding deadline. It's a contract that you, your counselor, and your teacher all sign this contract to say you understand that that's where you want to go to college. Most students aren't yet at that point, especially at this time of senior year, especially in this particular year, I think, to make that kind of declaration. So I personally am more encouraging of early action. We have scholarship at McDaniel because we are a private college. Our sticker price is higher than a lot of the public schools. Um, but does that mean people pay that? Not even close. Um, you need to go through the financial aid process to know exactly where you stand when it comes to financial aid. We require the FAFSA. Um, so you would submit the FAFSA as a the loan piece of documentation we need for financial aid reconsider, uh, excuse me, financial aid consideration. But we do offer merit scholarships that range from $15,000 up to $28,000 a year in annual scholarship. And getting scholarship doesn't mean you can't get financial aid based on need. A lot of students get a, a combination of the two. They'll get some scholarship, but then they'll also get additional financial aid. But you will know your out-of-pocket costs before you'd be expected to make your enrollment decision by that May 1st deadline of your senior year. Is that everything? I think it is. And that's just me. All right. So now I will oops, move on. We're gonna go on to UMBC. Oh, I left, left off the name of UMBC. <laughs> Sorry about that, Dale. Um, but there's your presentation. There we go, all right. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, first off, one of the things that I will share with you is never underestimate the, the role that Ms. Jackson has in your um, college going behavior process and the assistance she can provide. Um, we actually have an admissions advisory group in our office and um, the very first one we convened, she was a member of that committee to help us understand how we can better connect with Baltimore City students. And one of my favorite stories ever, and she will know who I'm talking about, Chris Herod, was a student um, when she was on the high school side, came to UMBC from the city, graduated from UMBC without any debt and did a lot of legwork behind the scenes to make that happen in addition to the funding we um, we provided to him. So I say all of that to say, you all can do it just the way Chris did it. Um, it's a phenomenal story. Um, he still gives back to the community in a lot of ways. And Ms. Jackson can tell you more about that when you have a chance to connect with her. But I always look for those inspirational moments and the ways to be inspired. And he is one that inspires me. And she was very much along with him in that journey. And so um, when you look here, the first slide we have about UMBC is a picture of our campus. And you might say, why are you showing me a picture of UMBC when we're about 10 minutes from downtown Baltimore? Well, one of the things that I've learned in my time at UMBC is there's a lot of people that have never set foot on our campus, have never been on the campus in any way, shape or form. And they get there and they're like, oh, this is a real campus. And what we like to show here is really the breadth of what UMBC offers. And you get a really good understanding of who we are. So when you see this, this is 500 acres, um, but it really encapsulizes what UMBC is about. Because if you go down the farthest road there where it shows the tech center, that takes you to BWI Airport. And so when we talk about um, UMBC and you look at our numbers, we are, have been recognized as one of the most diverse campuses in the entire world, and the entire country. Um, in some of the rankings, we're actually in the top 10% for our international population. We have over 100 students from 150 different countries, depending on how you count diplomat sons and daughters. I know Hopkins is in a similar bucket, and you know we're really proud of that fact. But it also, just as equally important, is our proximity to Annapolis, the capital of Maryland. So if you're going into the policy arena, there's some opportunities there. To the downtown Baltimore, once again, um, part of this, we know that's part of our mission is to serve. Baltimore City in the state of Maryland. And then you also see um, the arts, which are such an integral part of UMBC and how we bring it all together with our interdisciplinary life sciences building, where the sciences connect with the arts because it is great to be a, 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 a mechanical engineer. And your first goal was to have that bridge stand up, but it's equally important when you have that bridge that you're building to understand the social implications for that. And if it's a toll only and those that can't afford it and those that cannot, um, that has serious consequences and, and implications, and we like to talk about that. And so, you know, it's great if you can figure all the ways of the medical world are out, but if you can't do it in a human um, type of way, well, then it's really for not. And one of the things, you know, you've, you've heard a lot of people mentioning COVID in different ways today. 
one of the things that we are so proud of on our campus is the Surgeon General of the United States, um, Jerome Adams, he is a UMBC graduate. Um, and right before that, the Deputy Surgeon General who reported to him, she was a UMBC graduate. So the top two health policy officials in the US were UMBC graduates, African American, man and a woman leading these discussions. We also have one of the companies that's leading the, 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 uh, the work in trying to find a vaccine. Kizzy is a UMBC Meyerhoff graduate leading that work. And so once again, that is, that's some of the, the, the power and the punch of the UMBC degree and what we're very proud of. Um, when you saw on UMES's slide, one of the great things about the state of Maryland is the breadth of options you have from small to large universities to different types of institutions, whether HBCUs, whether public, you know, minority serving institutions, is the fact that um, we were ranked in those same rankings with US News and World Report this past year for those rankings that just came out. We ranked number 11 for the, um, our commitment to undergraduate teaching and number nine for being one of the most innovative schools in the entire country. And so when you talk about all the schools in the country, number 11 and number nine, that's pretty powerful. And some of the schools on that list for innovation and commitment to teaching are Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Caltech. And so those are some ones that, you know, we're proud to be a part of that company. We're also proud to be different from them. And especially when you look at price tag. So that's a little bit about the high level of the work that we do at UMBC. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Mavis. I think I'll pick it up here. And that talks about the academic opportunities. We have a hundred and some different majors. We're very well known for our STEM programs and in particular um, for students in, um, students of color graduating in the STEM fields. We have actually had more students from UMBC graduate to go on and earn their PhDs and MD PhDs than any other school in the, in the, in the country. And we're really proud of that fact. Um, and if you actually look at our numbers, if you break them down, we're about 34% um, white. Um, about 28% Asian American, 20% African American, 6% Hispanic, and then uh, the rest of our students um, um, make up that population. But we really talk a lot about the work we do and the academic opportunities for students of all races, but in particular those of color going into the sciences. Um, we've been profiled on 60 Minutes. Um, the New York Times has written up our, our the Mile program as a model for uh, across the country for students. Um, same thing with our honors college. Um, and we're a place where we say it's cool to be smart. Our students come to UMBC. Um, they're not looking for the Saturday afternoon football game sorority and fraternity parties. Um, we do have fraternities and sororities on our campus, but our students um, they're, that are joining those, they're very much um, giving in nature. I say our students are innately good. And you ask them what they like to do, they like to volunteer for Habitat and Humanity. They do a lot of service and giving back. Um, our director of our honors college says, if you're a little bit of a geek and a little bit of a nerd, and he does this, this really cool South African accent, um, he says, that's all of our students giving you a hug. And so once again, at UMBC, it's a place where we say it's cool to be smart. You wanna go to the next slide, Mavis? And what you're going to see here is talking, and I, because I know what it is, and as Mavis is pulling up, is about the honors experience. People often see, why, why, do you, why are you the honors university? And what we say is that frequently talks about the experiences our students only have, um, that students typically only have in an honors um, college, all of our students have at UMBC. So whether that is in the honors college, one of our scholars programs I was talking about, but what it does, it allows you to go on to the next step. So at UMBC, um, about two thirds of our students will directly enter the workforce. Another third will go on to graduate schools. And so you can go to great schools like Hopkins or University of Maryland downtown, the Ivy League school, get the undergraduate education paid for, and um, then go to the other place. And because of your experience, get that paid for. One of my, another one of my favorite students was a white female. Um, she was a physics major. Um, she was getting ready to graduate. Lauren Persky was her name. And she was in physics, which once again, not a lot, not a lot of white female are going into. And she applied to Hopkins. And there was a professor there at Hopkins who was getting ready to retire, but he met Lauren and he said, I'm gonna stay so you can be my last student to be my legacy. Um, and I thought once again, that was such a cool experience and Lauren um, was able to take a, a advantage of that. So very proud of what is the honors experience at, at UMBC. We're gonna go to the next slide, Mavis, trying to stay on time here. Um, and what we're gonna talk about on this slide here is, 
you will see it's community. One of the things that people often say is what is different about all of your institutions? One of the things I would say to all of you as high school students, I think we have put a lot of pressure about the journey um, and getting in and completing a process. It should really be the joy and finding that place that is a great fit for you. One of the things that makes UMB so unique, we are test optional this year, like all other institutions, like many other institutions, um, is if you're a student who is serious about their work, who is serious about learning from others um, and really values relationship, that's the hallmark of the UMBC experience. It's one of the reasons I've been here for so long while I'll continue to be there. We're a place that that's our greatest story. And when you have everyone supporting you, it allows those outcomes for you to be successful and take that next step and whatever it might be. Happy to answer questions here as we move on later on, but I'll turn it over to whoever's next. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Pat Sam, I'm director, uh, Associate Director of Admissions. I am not the rep for Baltimore and Baltimore County. Uh, my colleague Calvin Wise is, he couldn't be here today, so I'm kind of stepping in and pinch hitting. Uh, but you can always reach out to either of us, anyone in our office, and we're happy to kind of talk through any questions. A um, little bit about Hopkins, there's, you can go to the next slide, maybe. There's um, nine different divisions of Hopkins. You can see them all down there, and they're spread out largely throughout the city. We have our School of International Studies. It's actually down in D.C. Everything else is either right in the city or right outside, I uh, like the Applied Physics Laboratory. But I'm going to talk about Homewood, which is home to our Whiting School of Engineering, our Career School of Arts and Sciences, and home to our undergraduate students that are in the Arts and Sciences and in Engineering. Um, Homewood itself, maybe you can go to the next slide. Um, Homewood itself is in Baltimore City. We're in kind of the Northern District. We are located in Charles Village. We are right next to Hamden and Remington, kind of two other neighborhoods that our students will take advantage of. It's a residential campus. It's a very traditional looking campus, uh, pedestrian, so it's park-like. If you haven't been up there, you can walk through campus at any time. We don't have tours going on right now, but we would love to have you when kind of things open back up. But if you just want to kind of see the campus, you're certainly able to do that at the moment. Um, our students live in on-campus housing for two years. They moved to off-campus their following two years. Academically, you can go that slide, maybe that's good. Um, academically, our students have many different opportunities. Um, you can see we have 52 minors, 46 majors. Most of our classes are under 20 students. And we want students to come and explore. So we don't have much that you have to take specifically. We just want you to take some classes that kind of fall in some different areas. So some humanities, social science, natural science, and quantitative or engineering focused courses. You'll be able to pick the courses that line up with what your interests are to make different connections. We have a liberal arts focus, even though we're a research university, we want you to look at the world through different angles. We want you to look at the world from different lenses so that when you leave Hopkins and go on to whatever is next, that you take those different lenses and you start applying them in different ways. We also want you to learn through hands-on experiences. We want you to have the opportunity to do research. We want you to have the opportunity to get involved in internships. You can go next slide, maybe. Um, we want you to have kind of that chance to take that classroom learning and start applying it into real world situations. So you'll see almost all of our students take advantage of these things like research or internships. And it's important to us, we were founded as the first research university, founded with that liberal arts focus. And we want students to be able to kind of create the new knowledge that is what research is. And we want them to take those experiences and apply them. And to that end, one of the other key things that we were founded with is being a very diverse university. So we're one of the 10 most diverse universities in the country. We have students from every state. We have students from all over the world coming to campus. We have students with different racial and ethnic backgrounds, students from a wide variety of socioeconomic backgrounds, because it's important for us to fulfill our mission of creating students who are leaders in the world, to fulfill our mission of students who are lifelong learners and can learn from their peers. And so we want you to have that experience in college so that when you leave and you go out to the world beyond college, you're prepared for the, the world that's not just your neighborhood or your city, but whatever it is that you might encounter. Outside of academics, you can go to the next slide. Um, outside of academics, we have lots and lots of opportunities in student life. We have 400 different student-run organizations on campus. They do everything from arts and cultural um, things, to students that are involved in academic and career-focused organizations. We have students who are engaged in athletics at a bunch of different levels from varsity um, club and intramural levels, about 75% of our students get involved in athletics. 
We have students who are engaged in service. About 60 groups do service, primarily throughout Baltimore City. They work with our Center for Social Concerns and with a lot of our partners throughout the city to do many different things. And students generally also will tell you, they just like to hang out, they have fun, they like to go out in the city. Um, and so they're able to do kind of all of those things during their time at Hopkins. They live, like I said, in on-campus housing for two years and they'll move off campus, but everybody stays kind of in the same neighborhood in Charles Village even when they move off. So 97% of our students are in kind of that three to four block radius right next to campus. All of this leads our students to life beyond campus. They lead to what you're gonna do upon graduation, upon all of that. And so we have a center called our Life Design Lab that's gonna help students prepare for kind of the career side of things. They'll work with you and help you to understand how all of your experiences can help you become successful in whatever comes next. And not just that first job, but things that come down the road. We have pre-professional advising for students that are interested in professional graduate schools in medicine and in law. And they'll work with students during their time in undergrad to think about how can I make myself the strongest candidate? Certainly it's getting strong academics, but it's also finding other ways to do things like research and shadow professionals and make sure that when you step forward to, with your application, you're qualified, you're ready, and you're gonna stand out from the crowd. And so you'll have lots of support to help you through this. You can see our students go all over the place. We certainly, I know, get known for medicine, but you can see that students kind of spread the gamut in all different areas, both in their graduate school and in the places that they go out to work. And we're fortunate to have a very kind of robust uh, alumni network and lots of connections throughout the world to help students find those opportunities, whatever they may be upon graduation. I mean, go to the next slide. Um, just a few quick things about our application. You can see our deadlines for this year up here. We have early decision one and early decision two, which are binding agreements. So if you know Hopkins is your first choice at either of those points, you can apply to Hopkins. You're committing to saying, should I be admitted? I will enroll. If you're not sure, regular decision January 4th, and we'll look at you, and then you'll have the option, should you be admitted to enroll? Your financial aid will stay the same, regardless of any of those times you apply. Um, the Coalition and Common App are both acceptable. We are test optional this year, so if you took a test, you feel like, hey, it represents who I am, and it shows my academic strengths, and you wanna submit it, awesome. If not, really what we do for almost all of our applicants, though, is focus on what you've done in high school. What we're trying to understand through all the pieces that we look at in that application is who you're going to be in the future, and so academically, we wanna see the courses you've taken and we wanna see that you've done well. We know college is challenging. We wanna make sure students will come and be successful at a place like Hopkins. And so easiest way for us to do that is to look and see how you did in high school. We wanna know the type of student you are. So we're gonna to turn to your teachers and your counselor to kind of help us see that in a little bit bigger picture and help us see not just can you do the work, but how will you become a member of our academic community? Um, Stephanie had mentioned earlier that one of the things that's important in your letters, uh, or I'm sorry, in your activities list is that you're telling us all the things you're involved in. And that's again, us thinking about you in the future. Will you come and be engaged? What was the things that impacted your high school career so that we can think about you in the future? We can think about you as a member of our broader community and the things that you'll bring to that community to make it better. And then we wanna always hear from you and that's where your essays will come in and they'll help us kind of see you more as a person in a more full light. So make sure you're sharing of yourself and helping us see things that we might miss by just kind of the other components of your application. Um, you can go to the next slide. So a couple things about financial aid. We'll meet 100% of demonstrated need for our families. Um, as part of our financial aid packages at Hopkins, we don't have loans, so it's grant money that doesn't have to be repaid. There's a couple tools that you can see here on the screen that you can use to kind of gauge what that looks like, but we're committed to making sure Hopkins is affordable, for all the students that come here, we're committed to making sure that as students kind of go through, they don't have to worry about taking a certain major or following a certain path because they have loans to pay back. So we're in a very fortunate position and we know that. We wanna make sure the students can come and be successful without kind of having to worry about that so much. We have a special program for students in Baltimore City who attend Baltimore City Public Schools. So you have to live in the city and you have to have done uh, your 10th, 11th and 12th grade. Baltimore City Public or uh, select private, I'm sorry, select charter schools as well. And that program, the Baltimore Scholars Program for us, means that any student whose family earns less than $80,000 a year has full tuition, room board, and every, all their expenses covered. For students who 
following the gap between $80,000 and $150,000, their um, financial aid will be capped at only 10% at most would they have to pay. It will depend a little bit on your specific circumstances. And that program also has a cohort nature. So students will come through together as Baltimore scholars, They'll work with faculty, they'll work with other campus partners to have different experiences to make sure that you have a community built in that will help you succeed as you're, during your time in college, but also beyond it. So you'll work with our alumni and other people who have been Baltimore scholars over the years. So if you have interest in that, please let us know. And then the last slide is just our contact information. So um, you can go to the next slide, Mavis. And if you have any questions, please always reach out to us. You just forget who I am. If you forget who Calvin is, all you have to do is go to the meet the staff page and you can just enter your zip code and info will pop up so you can connect with us. But thank you very much for your time and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. All right. And last but certainly not least, we will hear from College Park. If I can get my slide to move forward. There we go. Mavis, for some reason, it looks like I'm a small picture in your picture, and I'm not sure why. But if that's okay with everyone, I'm going to keep going. If that's okay, it just looks like I'm a picture inside your picture. But if you're cool with that, I'm going to keep on going. <laughs> Does that work for you, Mavis? Mavis, can you hear me? You look fine of all of us. Is that Okay, as long as, thank you, Patrick, as long as I look fine to all of you guys, then I will keep on going. Thank you. On my screen, I'm a small picture inside Mavis's picture. So, hey, that works. Um, so my name is Courtney, thank you, Patrick, again. My name is Courtney Bolton, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Admissions and Diversity Initiatives here at University of Maryland College Park. I'm also the Baltimore City Territory Manager. So what that means is that if you are a student in a Baltimore City public or a charter school. I'm the person who will be helping in terms of knowing about, and yes, maybe you can go ahead and advance, thank you. Um, who knows about your schools. I also personally graduated from a Baltimore City High School as well. And so again, being knowledgeable about the schools and the resources and the high schools to make sure that I'm able to talk about Baltimore City Schools and also come visit you guys. I'm visiting you virtually right now, um, but again, doing, when we're back in person, looking forward to doing in-person high school visits. So University of Maryland College Park is the flagship institution. What that means in terms of the flagship institution, we have about 30,000 undergraduate students on campus. So it is a large state institution. If that's not what you're looking for, I'm certainly gonna talk later about ways to make University of Maryland College Park feel smaller in terms of nature. We have about 800 clubs and organizations. As you heard a few of my colleagues share, if there's a club or organization that you want to start at Maryland, that we don't have, if you have you and a few of your friends and a faculty advisor, you're easily able to start that club and organization. But again, we have a Terp Life link that you right now as current students in Baltimore can actually go on that link and see all of the different clubs and organizations that we offer on campus. Um, student government, cultural organizations. We also have something like the Salad Eating Club. You know, So if that's your thing, then hey, there you go. You have a club for it. We also have Quidditch, which is one of the things that was played in Harry Potter. So again, we have all those clubs and organizations at University of Maryland College Park. We are part of the Big Ten, so if sports is your thing in terms of wanting to go to a sports game with tons of team spirit, we are part of the Big Ten and that is an opportunity for you. We're about 43% or so students of color on our campus. We think about University of Maryland College Park and just if you need another ranking, um, Kim Linter ranked us number 10th in terms of personal best finance for um, among, my, among Best values among public colleges and institutions. So again, just a few rankings to share about the University of Maryland College Park. Maybe you can go ahead to the next slide, please. Thank you, Mavis. So on my next slide, you'll see a little bit about what we like to say is DC is truly calling when you think about University of Maryland College Park. So we're about 10 miles away from the nation's capital. Um, and then we're about, let's see, 40, 50 minutes away, depending on how you drive, um, from Baltimore. We do have a train stop that is not that far from campus. It's about a seven minute shuttle ride from campus. And so with that, you can catch the shuttle from um, campus over to College Park Metro Station. If you take the Mark train, the Camden line, you're able to go back and forth between Baltimore. So we're far enough away that hopefully your parents are not coming to visit you all the time. 
but also close enough in case you want to be able to get back home or you have those family responsibilities as well. So again, close in terms of proximity. With that same, um, at that same stop, we also have a shuttle. That shuttle, I'm sorry, in terms of we have a metro stop. With that metro stop, you're able to take the subway into DC. So that's why we like to say DC is calling. A lot of students will take the shuttle into D, the train into DC, I'm sorry, for opportunities in terms of research or internship opportunities. So again, a lot of our students, as they become upperclassmen, they might take classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday and Thursday, they're headed into DC for an internship opportunity as well, or just going into DC for the weekend, you know, for a cultural event. One of my favorites is personally the cherry blossom. So again, if that's something that you're into in terms of going to museums or going to see the cherry blossoms, you're able to do that at University of Maryland College Park and get there quickly. You can go ahead to the next slide, please, Mavis. So on my next slide, you'll see that we have 12 different colleges. Our 13th is our College of Letters and Sciences. And let me talk a little bit about how Letters and Sciences works at University of Maryland College Park. About 80% of our students that come into University of Maryland College Park are truly undecided in a major. So if that's you, you're not sure yet what you want to major in college, don't worry, we have you covered in terms of the College of Letters and Sciences. They have about 60 different advisors that work with students in terms of getting you into a major. So you can't graduate from University of Maryland College Park with a degree in letters and sciences. Then of our 12 different schools, um, in terms of colleges we offer, we have over 90 different academic majors on campus. Some of our most popular being computer science, biological sciences, psychology. We also have a public policy school as well, and a public policy major, engineering. One thing that I always like to point out, because as you saw in my earlier slide, picture of Kermit the Frog, Jim Henson is a famous alum of University of Maryland College Park. And while he was here, he actually created his own major um, through the individualized study program. So you are able to do that in terms of creating your own major, working the individualized study program to look towards designing your own major and graduating with that from University of Maryland College Park. Maybe you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So I want to share a little bit of information about special experiences and opportunities. If you do not remember anything I say this evening, please remember November 1st. And I cannot stress that enough. November 1st especially, and I'm going to drop down to those living and learning programs first. November 1st is important for opportunities for those living and learning programs, but also merit scholarships. And we all want merit scholarships, correct? We all want money to go to college. So with those living and learning programs, we have programs such as our Honors College, College Park Scholars, Global Community, Civicus. All of those are thematic in nature. And so when you apply to University of Maryland College Park, when you apply by that November 1 deadline, you are automatically reviewed and considered for any of those living and learning programs by invitation only. Again, those living and learning programs as it's cohort based in terms of the students are living and learning together. So they're all in the same residence hall and they're also taking a class together. We do offer education abroad. We have tons of opportunities in terms of if you wanted to do a whole year study abroad or a semester, or we even do some spring break wise or during the holiday break as well. And I talked a little bit about um, internships and research earlier. So maybe if you go ahead to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about how the admissions process works as well at University of Maryland College Park. The other thing I did want to mention is that just like our colleagues at Hopkins, we do have a scholarship that's also available for students in Baltimore. So we have two scholarships. One is our incentive awards program. So again, applying by November 1, please. The incentive awards program is a full ride opportunity to University of Maryland College Park. It's specifically for students in Baltimore, in terms of public charter, and they've offered a few private schools. Their listing of the private schools is on their website. And then also students in Prince George's County, and they've just recently added for this year, Montgomery County. But with that, it is a cohort-based model. Students receive, they truly say that they're a family. When they're on campus, they have Sunday dinner, for instance, um, in the Incentive Awards office. So again, truly a cohort in terms of a lot of students that graduated from that program talk about that's truly what made them successful at University of Maryland College Park. It is also the opportunity, the Incentive Awards Scholarship, for you to be able to study abroad should you choose to, which I would definitely recommend as some of my colleagues shared from other colleges. Think about doing study abroad when you're a student in college. It's much easier to do it when you're in college than when you become an adult and you're working all the time. Thanks to share. So in Maryland, we have 26 different factors we use in terms of our holistic review process. So again, I'm not just drawing a line and saying anyone under this GPA or SAT doesn't get into Maryland. It's a holistic review process and we're looking at all of these factors to make a decision for a student. So some of the ones that jump out to me when I think about this is if you're first generation or not, that's one of our 26 factors we use at Maryland. 
growth of life experience. So as Stephanie shared, and she stole my line about making sure you share other things outside of just what's happening in school. If you're working, make sure that's on your activities resume so that all of us as admissions for viewers have a full picture of you as a student. At Maryland, we have, we're usually receive about 32,000 applications for a class of around 4,500 students. With that, you can apply through the Coalition or the Common App. We just recently became a Common Application School as well. It is completely up to you which, um, did, which application platform you would like to utilize. Again, November 1, that is early action. And with our November 1 early action deadline, you are considered for those merit scholarships and living and learning programs. And last but not least, I want to talk about during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, this is just for my seniors. So again, if you are a sophomore, I saw we had some sophomores. This is only for my seniors. For this academics, um, this admission cycle for the seniors, we are going test optional. So again, if you're applying for this cycle, we are test optional at University of Maryland College Park. Some of my colleagues shared, we know some of the challenges that have happened due to not being able to have in-school testing or not being able to have access to a test due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So University of Maryland College Park for this cycle has gone test optional for students who apply. That does mean that there's an extra step though with your application process. And so with that, our checklist has changed a little bit in terms of there is now a TERPS application portal. That will be sent to you after you submit your application, usually within two to three business days. And that question will ask you if you want to be considered a test optional applicant or not. So I'm asking all of you guys now, if you're applying to University of Maryland College Park, be thinking now if you want to be reviewed test optional or not. So that's all it had for me. So thank you so much, Mavis, and I will turn it back over to you. Alrighty, so what I will do, I will open it up to questions. So if you have questions, you can type them in the Q&A box and we will um, answer all your questions. I know one of the burning questions that I actually got um, a couple of people text me beforehand, um, the, that one question, of course, it was um, the impact of SAT and ACT um, scores or not having them. And so I think people are just trying to figure out if I am able to test, um, how does that benefit me? Um, and so, you know, that's the question. So the, and actually it goes with the question that our first uh, participant is asking. Um, so, and this, I guess is specifically to College Park. It says, I know that um, test scores have played a big role in College Park admissions in the past, how is the process of review changing with the new test optional policy? So the, uh, it'll go to, I'll go to College Park first, but just in general, just, you know, really thinking about um, how does having or not having a test score impact your admissions? So I'll start with College Park and then I'll let others chime in. Sure, so maybe answer that question. So on our website too, it outlines our test optional policy and I should have mentioned that when I say test optional, I mean test optional fully. So we're not test optional just for admissions to the school, but also in terms of merit scholarships and living and learning programs. As you saw, we have always reviewed holistically. So we've always had those 26 different factors we've used in terms of our admissions process. And so with that, we are not, like I mentioned, drawing a line. So we will be looking at those other 26 different factors, those key factors, and making a decision on an applicant with our new test optional policy. We are not trying to disadvantage a student. So again, if you do not have a test score, you're not able to send one. We are test optional across the board. So that means for those living and learn prompts and also merit scholarships. And I'll let any of my other colleagues I was gonna say talk about that question. I know we're all getting that question a lot right now. Um, well, for the ones of us that have just recently gone test optional. Yeah, and what I would say, just piggybacking on what Courtney has said, I think the key thing here, and a good question for all the students tonight, whatever institution you're applying to, what does test optional mean? Because what we have learned is there's lots of different definitions about that. And so um, similar to College Park at UMBC, when we are test optional, um, that would also be the case for any um, merit award, scholarship, scholars programs, admission to the Honors College. So we will be taking a holistic review of the application, looking at grade point average, strength of the curriculum, the variety of factors that you present in the application. Um, and we're going to do whatever is to the benefit of the student. Um, and so even if you might, we ask on the Common App, do you want to be considered um, test optional. If we find out that maybe you didn't check the right box, we're going to follow up and try to figure out what, why you may or may not have checked that um, box to help you um, because we really want you to put your best foot forward. And in some cases, people don't have access to the advising to help them understand the ramifications of all these decisions. And so that's why we always want to work to the benefit of the student, knowing that some people may have more access than others to the information. 
and we never want that to be the deciding factor in what we do with admissions. And I should have mentioned as well, we have an early action deadline of November the 1st uh, with a final deadline of February the 1st. So pretty much the same thing like my like my colleagues mentioned. Um, you for regular admissions it, at this particular time for the academic school year, it's not going to matter. You can go ahead and submit it if you have them, but it, we're not going to we're not going to need them. But when it comes to my honors program, they're still requesting them, but they are still making accommodations for students. If um, you haven't taken the SAT and you meet their GPA requirements, they will still request them from the students. And one of the students asked in the chat too, why do we all decide to go test optional? Because we just, because it is COVID-19 and just because many of the facilities were, they were open, then dates were getting canceled. So that's why many of the schools at this particular time decided to cancel, um, just waive the SAT and the um, ACT for this year. Yeah, and I would add to that, like literally I was working with a student last week, they have registered to take the SAT five different times and all five different administrations have been canceled. And so there are literally students who, and we say ACT because we're on the East Coast, um, but this would also be applicable to ACT um, as well. So any standardized test scores, um, we are test optional, but students just don't have access to the test. That's why we made that decision. Thank you. Um, I'll pose this question to the panel and it's about um, our undocumented students or our ESOL students. Um, also thinking about, you know, just kind of um, what recommendations do you have for um, our undocumented or ELL um, or ESOL students in terms of navigating the um, admissions process? Um, in terms of kind of the process for undocumented students, um, we treat them uh, for the purposes of kind of financial aid as domestic students. So they receive financial aid the same way as any uh, student who is a citizen of the United States or a permanent resident of the United States would receive. So from that end, um, not any different than maybe your peers that you're going to school with. And grants, there's no loans, so you don't have to pay any of that stuff back. Eligible for, um, every student's eligible for scholarships for us as well. So kind of in that way. Uh, on the other side, in terms of the ESOL, we have a little more limited um, buildup to kind of help students English language learn on campus. So typically students that are gonna to come to our campus already kind of have mastered English and are ready to learn in English. Um, and that's just kind of a function of where our university started and kind of is at the moment. So we, we don't have kind of ESOL classes. There's certainly tutors and things of that nature. We have a lot of students who are not first language English speakers on campus. They come from all over the world, not just the United States. So there's support structures there, but maybe not as comprehensive as some other schools. And I would say that for McDaniel, um, we do, our merit scholarship program is open to all of our students, whether they're U.S. citizens or not U.S. citizens. So um, the scholarship program is available to all. Uh, it's only when it comes to need-based financial aid, we have a limited amount that we can uh, give to students who are, don't have their U.S. citizenship. Um, and certainly, um, be aware if you are living in uh, Maryland, uh, the MS, uh, the MISFA, which is through the state of Maryland, because there are, uh, there is an ability for you to potentially qualify for some state of Maryland scholarship grant because of that MISFA application, which is basically Maryland's um, alternative because you can't do the FAFSA. Um, so that that is definitely a resource that you can utilize. And if you were to get those state funds to be able to bring with you um, you know, if you stayed within Maryland and attended a college. Uh, and we do not have, similar to Hopkins, we don't have any kind of ESOL support available. So for a, a student in a high school setting, uh, you know, if you are still taking ESOL co coursework um, into that senior year, uh, that could definitely present a challenge because we are a pretty writing intensive college. So um, without any of the necessary supports beyond our writing center, it could be a definite challenge. And we really don't want you to start college off in that kind of uh, position. We would rather it be a really positive, successful transition right away. So, um, you know, finding and utilizing programs that do have ESOL support at the college level, maybe the community college level, and then transferring to complete your bachelor's degree once you, you are up to that level where you know you'll be uh, competitive as well as successful. And, and for UMBC, um, 
um, for as a as a public university, the, um, the Dream Act, and it actually has recently changed. Where um, previously you needed to attend a community college your first two years, and then successful completion of more than two years, then you could go to the four year institution. Now, I think it's really important to understand for undocumented students, that is separate from admission purposes. And admission purposes, we are not looking at your legal status at all. We're, we're looking at your ability to be successful in the classroom. But what typically trips up a student in the process if they are undocumented is, if you're undocumented, you're most likely gonna be charged out of state fees. And for many of us, that's not something that we can easily do and completely understandable. So, um, but that's, those guidelines have been opened up a little bit that allows more students now to qualify for in-state residency. So um, it is something that once again, that I would, um, you know, we work with you in the admissions process. Um, the key thing is now, once again, the in-state residency is gonna be more likely um, coming in as an entering first year student, as opposed to a transfer. Um, I would note that you should check with us or whatever school you're applying to if you're a DACA student, because sometimes there's a little bit of different processes than the, the non-resident tuition exemption. That's what it's actually called for undocumented students in Maryland, the non-resident tuition um, policy, um, to see how the institutions want to handle that. Um, and finally, at UMBC, we are fortunate we have an English language institute. So we do have a large number of students that come to UMBC. Academically, we can see they can do the coursework. We've seen they've demonstrated the ability in math. They may have the English deficiency, and so we can um, admit them provisionally upon completion of the ELI. Um, and we know students, um, there's not just students coming from across the pond, so to say, but it can be students in Baltimore City who their families are first generations. Um, you know, one of the coolest things I saw at UMBC was at our commencement and at our um, convocation the past couple of years, Dr. Abowski has said, had our students stand to say, how many of you have a parent or family member who was born outside of the United States? And I would say we're almost two thirds of our students are in that bucket. And that's a real powerful thing to see. And when I see it, I get goosebumps knowing the opportunity that these students are having and to see them stand coming in and graduating. And I would say Dale pretty much summed it up. UMES is very similar. We do have our mission specialist that handles all of veterans as well as the whole international population. So Ms. Gladden, she will work with the family and students should they have um, be in that situation as well. Thank you. Um, one of the questions, I, I think the big question is, wh what are some ways that students can make their application stand out in the process? So, you know, one of the things is like the personal statement and just, you know, like what role does a personal statement and the letter of recommendation play in this process for students now? I'm happy to start us off. Um, so in terms of the essay, the essay has always had tons of weight. You know, if I will speak for Maryland specifically, we do not have an interview process for our application to University of Maryland College Park. So that means that your essay has always had worry in terms that is the only time for your voice to be heard during the application process. So students, you want to make sure you're taking advantage of that. Also, in terms of those living learning programs I talked about and merit scholarships, they are reviewing that same application you submit. So those letters of recommendation, your transcripts, um, you know, your essay. They're reviewing those and making a decision about not just if you're accepted into the college, but also if you're accepted into that living and learning program or invited to it and merit scholarships. So you want to make sure your application truly does stand out. Some of the tips I always say to students in terms of their essay is within those first two to three sentences, you should be trying to grab our attention. Now, of course, will we read it even if you do not grab our attention? Yes. But if we're receiving over 34,000 applications, you want to make sure your essay stands out. So making sure the topic is always you. And this is not the time to submit a paper that you've used in high school. This is not a research paper. Making sure even if you do something like a quote, for instance, for your essay, that you turn that quote into how it is impacted your life as well. You can also use the essay to talk about extenuating circumstances. So if something's been going on in high school that you need want an admissions committee to really know about, that's a great place to do it in an essay as well if you don't see we're going to see it in that box that you have for your application. And I would follow up with that. Um, also on the essay front, let's be real conscious of the fact that we're gonna all get COVID essay overload. So if you are thinking you wanna write about COVID, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when the person gets an injury and then writes about why they wanna be a physical therapist. There are certain themes that get really, really beaten down. 
And so I would, you know, two things I always say about essays, you know, if it's something, I mean, we've never had a national pandemic, that's kind of new. Um, so that is different, but I've already read COVID essays and I'm, you know, I got two hands on the number of COVID essays and I think it's just going to get more and more. So ideally a personal essay should be individually, it's reflective of something that is significant to you. So unless this really, really contributed to some huge metamorphosis on your part, ideally choose something different if you can. Uh, there is a section, especially since a number of us do use some kind of common app uh, offering, there is a section for you to do like additional extenuating of circumstances. That could be an opportunity to write about maybe the COVID impact academically as it contributed, but by and large, the essay needs to be lots of I statements, lots of personal reflection about what it means to you. Um, so, so please be very uh, mindful of that. And also um, back to kind of the activities and the resume, uh, it's a quality over a quantity thing. I don't want to know everything you've ever done. I want to know the things that you value the most and have first ninth through 12th grade and likely the things you'll want to contribute and be involved with when you get to college. So uh, not everything you've ever done. It's really the things that you've you know, held significant. And please don't diminish the importance of leadership. If you've been a shift manager at your job, if you are the lead counselor and you do some summer camp, you know, make sure you talk about those leaderships. Those, those are important for us because again, it gives us an idea of, oh, this is who's going to come to our our campus and they're going to be really active and want to be a, a, a leader on our campus. So uh, again, don't diminish anything that has, you know, kind of built you up and really made you a, a strong member in whatever capacity that's been. And I'll go just to add, Stephanie did a great job um, pretty much, but UMES, this is going to be really different this year for as far as regular admissions because we were always essay optional. So when it comes to our honors department, they have a whole committee and they like it's really weighted when it comes to your essay because it's still required. So they score your essays and that tells you how much money the, the honors department is going to give you. But this will be our first like we'll consider an essay. But if you're at a certain GPA average and you're a little bit under, then that's your time. Like Stephanie mentioned, share your leadership um, um, experiences, um, things, your other extracurricular activities and just pretty much tell your why. You know, why you're interested in going to college, let us know because we do understand, you never know, you may have some traumatic experiences that happened the first couple of years of school or, you know, just share why things were affected academically. Um, and I'll just, to the younger students, so the ones that are in ninth, 10th, 11th grade, um, you guys are in a little bit of a different situation than those that are applying right now and that you have some time to alter some of the things along the way that will help you strengthen your application. So all the things that you heard as we're telling the students who are getting ready to apply, you want to think about them in the future. So you want to think about how do you prepare yourself academically, take some challenging courses, push yourself academically so that we can see that when the time comes for you to apply to our schools. Find some things to engage in, find opportunities within whatever you're participating in to make an impact so that you can tell us about that. So when the time comes for you to sit down and write those essays, to craft that activities list, to think about your transcript and how that looks, you've done that. So take the time now to kind of think about that as you go through this process. Don't wait till the end of it and say, I gotta do everything in senior year. You can start doing that along the way to make yourself a strong candidate when the time comes. And I think one thing is great about this panel tonight and what's a little challenging too when you're virtual is we're all trying to be considered and let others not talk first and so it's kind of nice to go last to say yes ditto to what all my colleagues said like I think back to Stephanie um, and you know a couple years ago when the common app there was a question of where do you like to think you know you do your best thinking and our staff said if we read one more question about the bathroom we were going to like puke because um, that was what everyone wrote that year you know and people ask this question a lot and, and one of the things you know don't sound like you swallowed a thesaurus the best essay is for you to genuinely and authentically represent yourself. Um, and the best way I ever heard it summarized is a student once or someone said it once was to give your essay to one of your best friends and would they know right away it was you. And that is a great essay because that's what you're trying to do is to genuinely say, this is who I am. Because that's what we should be doing in this admissions process. You've worked hard for 13 years to get to this point. Where is the next step in the journey that allows you to really build up on those experiences to be successful? So when you try to represent yourself or say something you're not, that doesn't allow us to have the insight into who you are. Um, and, that, and so I think that would be 
you know, kind of in my summary is to say this whole thing, this should not, this admissions process should not be a process. It should be a journey that you get to celebrate what you have worked so hard to achieve. It's not, I check this box, this box, this box to get this outcome. Um, and that's once again, when you get long in the tooth, like I have in this profession, Stephanie, I'm going to suck you in with me because you've been there with me on this journey for 20 some years too. Look, she's like, oh yeah, Dale. But when you get this way, you get a little more nostalgic about the process and you really want to see what's best for the students. And that's really what our wish is for them as admissions professionals. Can I come back on that, Steph? <laughs> I entered college at 10. So I, you know, I'm just one of those advanced people. Don't suck me down with you. <laughs> I want to thank you, all of our panelists, for their um, their time today. Their, you know, it's an evening. It's a Wednesday. Um, I just want to thank you for your time, sharing the information. I know um, I got a lot of text messages as we were going from people that were in in the session. They were like, "Oh my God, this is so great! I didn't know. I didn't know. You know." So I think. Um, I think people felt like they got that insider scoop around what it is that they need to do in terms of focusing, especially given COVID-19, but also know that everyone shouldn't write that COVID essay because that's going to be the essay that everyone writes. So maybe you don't write that COVID essay, but thank you so much. I want to thank you all for participating. Um, thank you panelists for being with us today. Thank you students, parents, family, friends. Um, I see JHU Engineering. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, but thank you all for being here. And uh, we do plan on hosting some additional sessions. So we're going to host one around financial aid and um, in COVID because I know that's another like big question. So um, please stay tuned for that. Um, and with that, I will leave you to your evening. So thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Bye.